Welcome to American Dreams, Keys to Success, with your host, Alan Olson. Welcome back. I'm here today with Roger Royce. He is the founder of the Royce Law Firm with three offices in Palo Alto, San Francisco, and Los Angeles. Roger, welcome to today's show. Thanks, Alan. It's good to be here. Roger, give me your background. How did you get to where you are today? Where I am today? <clears throat> well, you know, I've been, I've, I've got quite a diverse background, actually, in the law. I started out practicing in the Midwest on the Great Plains, uh, out working in the oil fields and agricultural areas of North Dakota. And in the end of the 80s, I moved to New York City, uh, furthered my education in tax law, and uh, liked it so much I stuck around, and I worked with a big law firm on Wall Street uh, during the, the end of what they called the go-go 80s, doing some of the big M&A deals. Uh, <clears throat> worked on some the transactions we worked on in New York are the kinds of things that you would have read on and read about on the front page of the New York Times. It was very exciting. Uh, in um, early 90s, I came out to Silicon Valley. And uh, since being out here, it's been mostly technology, technology companies. We recently opened an office in Los Angeles a few years ago. So we've gotten involved in the entertainment industry as well. So you could say that I've done a little bit of pretty much a lot of the big industries in the United States and have settled primarily here in Silicon Valley now, working here in what I think of as the center of the technology company universe, uh, certainly the center of the startup and venture capital universe. You know, it said that about 50% of the venture capital money in the world runs through Silicon Valley. I, I believe it. I mean, I drive, I, I tell people, we work with a lot of companies and entrepreneurs from other countries, and when they come to visit the, the Valley or when I go to visit them, I tell them that on my way to work every morning, I drive past $10 billion a year of venture capital. <laughs> there seems to be a lot uh, more and more entrepreneurs that are raising capital through crowdfunding uh, to bring their ideas to fruition. Uh, what is crowdfunding? Yeah, so so let's be careful about terms because um, when people say crowdfunding right now, they usually mean crowdsourcing. They mean things like Kickstarter and Indiegogo uh, where uh, we're, that everybody is familiar with, and I'm working with a new fund called Gazillion Fund, which is doing something similar where uh, the company will basically solicit donations. It's not a store, but you know the the, uh, the contributor might get a uh, might get a baseball cap or something like that. That's what's legal now. The crowdfunding that we've been hearing about in the press a lot recently uh, is equity crowdfunding, and that's the idea that companies will be able to go out on a on an internet portal and sell their securities to unaccredited investors. Uh, just through the internet. Now, that is not yet law, um, and it's unclear as to when it will ever become law because it requires implementing regulations by the Securities and Exchange Commission, and they've been um, surprisingly slow uh, to get through these regulations, uh, and probably not so surprisingly because there are so many flaws in this law, it's going to be quite difficult uh, for the regulation drafter to put in place enough protections and enough um, direction in order for companies to go out and implement this new law in a meaningful way. So that's the crowdfunding we've been hearing about. It's not yet law, and it's unclear as to when it will be. Uh, while I'm on the topic, there's another provision of the law that has gotten a lot less attention, but I think is going to be much more important, and that is what we call the changes to Rule 506, allowing solicitation of accredited-only investments. As the law is today, if a company is going to do a financing and it is going to go out and solicit uh, investors, uh, it really cannot do public solicitation. It can't do advertising. It has to be personal relationships, that sort of thing. The change, to, and that's, that's, a, that's in, in Regulation D of the securities laws, the proposed change would allow advertising and solicitation of accredited only investments, meaning that the investors must be accredited. They have to have either a million dollars of net worth, excluding principal residents, or $200,000 a year of annual income, $300,000 jointly. So if all of the people who actually invest meet those requirements, then the company is allowed to advertise. It can skywrite. It can go through the phone book and call people, whatever. It can solicit. Uh, that also is not yet law. We're waiting for final regulations. But when it does become law, that I think is going to be very big. The one thing that is going on now that's really interesting in this industry 
is that there were a couple of no-action letters by the Securities and Exchange Commission about a month ago that may just open the floodgates to one-off, single-member, uh, special-purpose entities that are designed to go out and invest in companies. Uh, they will likely be accredited only, and they will not be publicly solicited or marketed. But still, you're going to see uh, a very creative and interesting way that companies are going to be able to go about raising money. I'm visiting here today with Roger Royce. He is the founder of the Royce Law Firm with offices in Palo Alto, San Francisco, and Los Angeles. Uh, Roger, we need to take a quick break, but when we get back, I want to talk about your new book, Dead On Arrival. We'll be right back after these messages. With current laws, we have left our children an enormous financial burden. Even though they may be too young to understand it. At Groco, we care about you and the ones you love and the quality of your and their lives. Call us today to see how we can help. 877-CPA-2006 Groco, helping you along the way. Apple pie, baseball, and now here's All-American Alan Olson. Welcome back. I'm here today with Roger Royce. He is the founder of the Royce Law Firm with offices in Palo Alto, San Francisco, and Los Angeles. Uh, Roger, moving through the next topic, I want to talk about your book you recently released, Dead on Arrival. First, what, what inspired you to write this book? Well, Alan, you know, as I mentioned, I've worked all with industries in various industries all over the country and indeed all over the world. Uh, and over the past 30 years that I've been doing this, I noticed that regardless of the industry, regardless of the country, uh, regardless sometimes of the people, it was oftentimes the same mistakes that companies would make. And especially being out in Silicon Valley working with startup companies, uh, I would see over and over again people coming into my office that have a great idea and they got a great business plan and uh, they've managed to line up the financing and they seem to have everything in place but they made some legal mistake. And it would usually be one of a fairly discreet list of mistakes that they made. And most of these mistakes we could deal with, we could clean up. Some of them we could deal with, but it might cost them a little bit on valuation. Uh, but some of those mistakes were just what I began to call dead on arrival mistakes. They'd come in and I'd just have to give them the bad news. You're dead on arrival. You need to go back and completely start over. That's where the title of the book came from. And the book basically summarizes what the major issues are for startup companies. And I think it's important for every entrepreneur to, to have an idea of what to avoid and what to do and just have a roadmap. There was really nothing out there like this to give them a sense as to what the legal landscape looked like when they should see a lawyer. What kind of lawyer to see, whether their advice that they were getting was consistent with industry practice. So that's the impetus for the book. What are some of the, uh, the, 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 the important factors that causes a small business to fail? Well, uh, yeah, so <clears throat> certainly there, there, are, there are lots of pieces to the puzzle. And uh, as you know, a good accounting and tax compliance is one of them, mm -hmm. uh, certainly good business development, good marketing. There's a lot of things from my standpoint. I like it. I, my job is to make sure the company has good legal bones, right? They get started on a very solid legal foundation. And oftentimes, entrepreneurs will wait a little bit too long before they put that in place. Uh, I saw a statistic recently that almost half of the companies in America don't even consult a lawyer. They just do it themselves. So there's somewhat of a, a lot of landmines out there just waiting to explode. So the biggest factor I would say that causes a company to have problems is just not documenting, just waiting too long and not getting things in writing and documented and established. What are some of the common legal mistakes that companies should watch out for in the startup stage? So that's the first one, of course, is just lack of documentation. Uh, once a company uh, decide, gets past that and they understand that they do need to document uh, their relationships, it's important that they, that they select the right kind of entity, right? It has to be the right kind of entity. It's important that the equity split among founders be agreed to in advance and be in writing. It's important that there be technology assignments to the company. It's a real problem if a company gets way down the road and, 
ends up in front of their potential investor and then discovers in due diligence that they don't own all the rights to the technology that they thought they did. You would be surprised how often that happens. Mm -hmm. uh, employment laws are a real sleeper because almost every startup I know is noncompliant. You know, it's counterintuitive, it's complex, it's Byzantine, especially if you're unlucky enough to be in a state like California. So employment laws is a place where companies are well advised to seek some good legal counsel. And then, of course, on the securities. Every once in a while, we'll see a company that will jump the gun on issuing securities or taking money from investors without securities compliance. And that can be a very serious problem. I'm visiting here today with Roger Royce. He's the founder of the Royce Law Firm with offices in Palo Alto. San Francisco, and Los Angeles. Roger, we need to take a quick break, but when we get back, I want to talk about strategic planning for a company and the role an attorney should play with companies. He's the world's most trustworthy man. Tax filing deadlines are scheduled around his vacation calendar. The IRS agent who audited his client apologized. <laughs> I don't always advise people on their taxes, but when I do, I save them every penny legally possible. GroKo CPAs and Advisors. Come to GroKo and stay wealthy, my friend. Apple pie, baseball, and now here's All-American Alan Olson. Welcome back. I'm here today with Roger Royce. He is the founder of the Royce Law Firm with offices in Palo Alto, San Francisco, and Los Angeles. Uh, Roger, in the area of a company uh, starting to grow and they have all their strategic initiatives, um, how important is all this strategic planning important for a company? When a person comes to you and says, Roger, I'm going to start a company, uh, what does the attorney look for? Yeah, great question, Alan. Um, unlike a lot of other lawyers, I very much believe in a team approach. I don't think that there's uh, any one person that can solve all of the problems that a company has. So the very first thing I do when I meet a new client is I make sure that, uh, that all the right seats on the bus are filled, that they've got the right team members in place. Part of that, like I said, is accounting, part is tax, part is HR, part is benefits, part of it might be business development, and of course my part is oftentimes the legal part. Now, in the legal and tax planning that we do for for a company, the very first question we have to ask, especially in a current environment, is are you incorporated in the right state and or country, and do you have the right kind of entity? And unfortunately, with what's been going on with the tax law lately, uh, a lot of companies are finding that even small companies and startup companies are finding that it's worth it to form intellectual property holding companies in foreign tax havens or to form base companies in other jurisdictions. In other words, what I'm seeing in my practice is that the tax law is making a is having a big impact on not only the type of entity people form uh, or what state they incorporate in, but in what country they do business in. So part of our strategic planning has a very decidedly international aspect to it. Now, for the listeners, what exactly is the company doing if Apple goes down to the British Virgin Islands or some of these other companies, and what are they working towards? Yeah, so I can answer that for you uh, by giving you some numbers. I know you're an accountant, and I know you like numbers. So here's a statistic that ought to just scare the heck out of everybody. Um, about half of the Fortune 500 companies in this country pay on a regular basis an effective tax rate of 15% or less. Now, the only way that they're able to do that is by using offshore vehicles and by moving technology and intellectual property offshore. And why is that scary? Not only because of the loss of the, of the revenues that the U.S. is realizing, but the erosion of the tax base. Because when an IP and that technology moves offshore, guess what? The jobs follow it. So clients come into my office, and I have this happen on a regular basis. They say, gee, you know, we're thinking of locating a, a, a big presence here in Silicon Valley, but you know there's also Ireland, which has lots of incentives. And there's the Netherlands, which is a really great base company for Europe. And or maybe they, they've got the metrics to put in place a Cayman Islands or BVI IP holding company. And, and today, uh, it makes more sense for more companies to do that than was true 10 years ago. I guess international is, uh, is, is an important part of anyone 
looking to uh, put their strategic plan together, especially with the internet today. And Very true. The economy has changed and the tax law has not kept up with it. We now live in an information age with a uh, very mobile economy. The last major tax overhaul we had was in 1986. Remember 1986, Alan? Oh, yeah. Passive loss rules and the... <laughs> yeah. That's the last time. There was no such thing as Google in 1986. There was no Facebook. We could not even conceive of a Facebook. I mean, the world was much different then. The tax law has changed dramatically since then. Or I'm sorry, the world has changed dramatically since then. The tax law has not. And it's time now for it to change because the U.S. is certainly losing business. Roger, your firm is very progressive. In fact, they're, uh, you know, I appreciate all the, the things that you've done with the education seminars and the webinars. But uh, it, it's, it's made your law firm very unique uh, with the amount of video and, and um, other technology tools that are used out there. Now, what, what's next for the Royce Law Firm? Well, I'm glad you asked that. Um, we've, been, we've been working, I've been working for probably three years now on, um, on a, tech, a consumer-facing technology solution. And we currently have, the problem with, you know, as the world changes, the law practice is changing as well. And legal services are just too expensive. They just are. You know, the rest of the industry has gotten much more efficient. Legal has lagged behind. Maybe it's because it's regulated, uh, maybe because lawyers are just slow to act. Well, we've come up with our own solutions that we call the Royce Law Legal Wizard. And it does a couple of things. Uh, number one, it's a form generator. So our clients can go on to our Legal Wizard. They can find a document. They can fill out the form. They can complete their own document. Then route it to an attorney to review and make sure that it's right and all the commas are in the right place and do what we attorneys do and then send it back to the client. It drives the cost of delivering those documents way down. We are now about to launch a legal wizard that is going to provide for a questionnaire, a query, basically a, a set of queries that the consumer can answer in a questionnaire form, very simple, 10 questions, and bam, you've got your corporation or your LLC or your S Corp or, or whatever, your, your limited partnership. And our system is going to provide legal advice. The problem that a lot of these technology solutions have in the legal world is that they are missing this very important part of, of legal judgment. And the thing is, Alan, guys like you and I will never be replaced by computers. But there are certain things, certain repetitive tasks that can be replaced by computers and made much more efficient. So our system relies on both the technology component as well as a real live lawyer to get a very efficient solution. Roger, how does an individual contact your firm? You can reach me through my website, which is www.roycelaw, with an S, R-O-Y-S-E-L-A-W.com. Uh, we have a resource site called Royce University, where we post our videos, our blogs, our articles, and other content. And, of course, we have a relationship site for selected clients, service partners, and investors at RoyceLink.com. Visiting here today with... Roger Royce, he is the founder of the Royce Law Firm. Roger, thanks for joining today's show. Thank you, Ellen. We'll be right back after these messages. You're listening to American Dreams with Ellen Olson on AM 1220 KDOW.